Okay, good evening and welcome back everyone to our Nordic options education session where we were discuss the current market conditions and opportunities that we currently see in the markets. This is the cadence that we are going to take going forward throughout the year where we spend some time teaching options education and then take some time to review where the current markets are sitting um, and what our outlook for the broader markets are to help you inform your trading decisions and to help you have ideas that you can apply the strategies to your portfolio. Before we get started, what we're gonna discuss here today is purely for education and demonstration purposes. It is not a solicitation or recommendation to buy or sell any specific securities. So we'll start off by just again, reviewing our options education agenda, what the next couple of options education sessions are going to cover and include so that you can plan for attending those sessions. We'll do a broader mark, uh, Nordic market review. We'll take a look at the four major markets, where they currently sit. We'll also take a look at sector rotation data to see which sectors are leading, which sectors are lagging behind. So as you're looking for opportunities, both on the long and short side of the broader markets, where, which sectors do you want to focus on? We'll start taking a look at some of the economic indicators, which for the month of April have really started to pick up quite a bit. So uh, reviewing those economic indicators, understanding what they mean and how to read them in order to, to uh, move forward. Then we'll review some of our trade ideas, uh, and then I'll show you how to access our new options trading course. And then we'll open this up for Q&A here at the very end. So those are the things we're gonna go over here during today's session. So just a quick review of the upcoming earnings, uh, upcoming education session today is a market outlook series. This is really where we talk about the broader markets, take a look at the context of the broader markets, the sectors, and then individual trade ideas that we may have. Uh, two weeks from today, we're going to talk about cover calls. Uh, this is going to be an introductory session on option selling. We're going to start with cover calls, and then four weeks later, we're going to do cash secured puts. These are the two most popular strategies for strategies if you're selling options. So selling cover calls, selling cash secured puts, we're gonna break down each one. We're gonna go over the strategy, we're gonna talk about optimal strategies and we're gonna show you how to apply these strategies to your portfolio. And then in between that, we're gonna do another Nordic Market Outlook series so that you can see how um, you know how I'm viewing the current markets. And just a, a bit of a housekeeping, this week, we recently just launched a new feature where if you are selecting a strike price using options play, you can now see the delta of the strike price next to the strike price and the premium. So you have three, three columns. You have your strike price, which is the first column. You have the premium, and then you have delta on the third column. So this helps you select your strike prices based on delta, because many times when we teach investors on how to select strike prices, we always use Delta to select our strike prices. No matter what strategy we're trading, whether we're buying or selling a call option, if we're selling uh, you know, call or put as part of a strategy, or if we're just selling them as like a cover call or short put, we always use Delta because Delta helps us approximate the probability of a strategy um, being profitable. So it really helps us make sure that every single time we select the strategy, we use the same strike prices. So Delta is a big piece of that. And that's why we've added Delta to your strike dropdown so that you can quickly understand which deltas to choose uh, for any strategy. So that's already enabled here for your options play account for the Nordics. So during today's session, what I want to help investors answer is how can I expect, uh, how can we expect further market uh, weakness, you know, sorry, can we expect further market weakness or is the weakness that we're currently seeing, is that a buying opportunity for the broader markets? So that's the question that I think a lot of investors have been asking here over the past week. So we want to try to help answer some of those questions using technical research, using the charts, using economic research to inform our decisions and also take a look at some of the ideas that we have here in the broader markets. So those are the things that I wanna make sure that we take a look at here today. So we'll start off with just a broader review here of the Nordic markets. So the Stockholm 30 index, uh, very strong performance here since the beginning of the year when it started to break out here above this 1950 level here, which is uh, this level, broke out, came back to retest this level support, and pretty much has not looked back since 
early January. Now, so far, what we've seen over the past month or so is a bit of a consolidation range or what we would typically call a flag formation. A flag formation is pretty common after a big move to the upside, a move that is generally speaking above trend. What I mean by above trend is, as you can see here, the, the Stockholm S30 index has been largely moving along at a similar pace. And then what you have here is an acceleration here to the upside above the trend line. Now, when you have this type of big move to the upside, many times what we tend to see is a bit of consolidation, a bit of a pullback here, or what we call a bit of an equilibrium. And then that usually allows the markets to potentially project higher here. Now, when we look at this trend line here, we're currently trading at the bottom of this trend or bottom of this, uh, this trend channel, if you will. Now, the concern from some investors looking at the other markets like US markets is that this actually breaks lower here. And it's possible that this breaks lower, right? Because you could also just say that this is a, a consolidation range that this is, a, this is a topping formation, if you will. You kind of have a bit of a double top that has formed. And the question is whether this breaks lower because if it does break lower, it projects fairly uh, quite a bit to the downside about 2040 or so. So there's quite a bit of potential downside if this support level, which is around 2200, 20, uh, just, just about 2200 fails to hold that support, there's quite a bit of potential downside. So the risk to reward right now certainly skews a bit more to the downside. If you do see a breakout back above 2280, then that would be more of a bullish play here. And especially if you get a breakout here of this uh, downtrend, that also would be a significantly bullish event here right now. So the Stockholm market, while very strong, taking a bit of a pause here, at what I would consider a fairly pivotal moment in terms of where it's currently sitting. If you look at the Copen 20, Copenhagen 25, now that's, what's interesting about this market is that as it broke higher here above this 1700 level, uh, it came all the way back to retest this level as support. And the question is whether this can bounce higher or if it starts to break below. Uh, if it breaks below, I would expect this to head all the way down to 1600 or so, which roughly lines up with the 200 day moving average, as you can see. Um, so 1600 will be my target here to the downside. So we're again at a pretty pivotal moment for all equity markets here globally, not just here in the Nordics, but also here in the US. The Helsinki market is still fairly strong here. It is still actually within the channel. The Helsinki market has really been very, I would say, orderly. You can draw this channel pretty much from um, start to finish like this. And we're still pretty much within this channel. So at this moment, I still expect this to continue in this particular trend unless we break below these trend lines. So far, we're not seeing evidence of that yet. Uh, momentum still remains fairly uh, positive here. So until you see a breakdown below this uh, rising support trend, if you if, if you can call it that, as you can see, we've we've hit it multiple times and bounce higher off of it. Uh, we would need to see a break below that level. If we do see a break below that level, then I you know from my perspective, some of the support levels to pay attention to here is closer to this 46. 50 level, which again corresponds roughly with the 200 day moving average. Um, so there is fair amount of downside here in many of these markets. And then lastly, the Oslo 20. Now what's interesting here about the Oslo 20, which is the fact that what we're seeing in many commodity type markets is that as, as price makes higher highs, momentum no longer confirming those highs, which puts a, a higher risk of a pullback here. So the, out of all of the markets, the Oslo market's providing a fair amount of uh, clear signals that ex there's exhaustion here in the markets, that there is a higher risk of a pullback here. Um, and then if we look at the Swedish markets, roughly you see, you see many of the similar things, right? Higher highs, no longer confirming those highs. And that's why the market has pulled back here. The question is how far can the markets pull back here? We don't quite have evidence just yet. The Copenhagen market certainly has pulled back to support. So it can potentially rally going from here. The Helsinki market still very much in this strong upward trajectory. And then the Oslo market, as you can see, higher highs, 
but lower highs on momentum. That's usually a potential weak sign of weakness of a potential pullback here, maybe down to the 900 level here or so on the Oslo 20. So if you look at the broader Nordic markets, there's quite a three, I would say three out of the four markets are at risk of of a pullback here. Helsinki is really the strongest one out of all of them. Um, uh, you know, and Copenhagen has pu pulled back to some support levels, so potentially can start outperforming here. That's really the, the 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 markets that you need to pay attention to right now as we look for opportunities here in the broader markets. Now, if we look at economics, this is really where April started to surprise a bit to the upside because uh, services, which is one part of the market that we really needed to see continuation of growth, started to slow down a little bit here in March, but we saw that acceleration here in April. Also, manufacturing that has been slowing down since uh, you know the beginning of the year also saw some acceleration here into April. So this is really the two segments of the market that you need to see um, growth from in order to sustain the equity market rally that has already happened. And what do I mean by that is that fact that during this time, you know, from January to March, uh, January to March, you know, the, the, the economics were not particularly strong, but equity markets were rallying significantly during this time. And this is because equity markets are forward looking. Equity markets are not just looking at historical data, it's anticipating what it expects future data is going to be. So far, future data has confirmed where the equity markets are trading. That is the minimum that the equity markets need in order to stay where it is right now. And then we really need to see this, to, this trend continue for equity markets to continue moving higher or at least sustain where it's currently trading. Now, if we look at the US, there are definitely evidence and signs that the equity markets may have gone a little too far too fast because uh, this particular earnings season, a very strong earnings season from a from a numbers perspective, yet equity markets are largely trading either sideways or even trading lower on what were good, what were anticipated as better than expected news. So this is something that you really have to start paying attention to. The one thing I will say that has changed significantly in Sweden is the fact that both consumer confidence and business confidence has seen a big boost here in April. Um, this is this is strong. This is not something we're quite seeing from most of the other markets at the moment, certainly not here in the US. We have not seen such strong increases to consumer and business confidence, but I will say that the US rebounded on these things much quicker, meaning a lot of these rebounds uh, happened in the US earlier last year. We're seeing this uh, very slowly in, in Sweden, but April was certainly one very big jump for both business and consumer confidence. That could sustain the equity market markets and possibly even sustain a bigger rally here in some of these markets. So economic data so far coming out of Sweden, quite strong here. So if we look at the sector rotation data, this is really where we need to pay attention to is where is their performance, meaning which sectors are leading and which sectors are lagging. So let's just point out at some of the leading indicators, uh, leading sectors. Energy has been a big winner here as crude continues to climb. Uh, telecommunications, very strong movement towards leading. Uh, financials, also a big mover here to the upside. And then we have consumer, um, sorry, basic materials moving towards the leading category. You also have consumer services moving, uh, I'm sorry, this is consumer uh, consumer goods that's moving higher here. You have consumer services moving lower. You have uh, healthcare moving lower. You have utilities moving lower and you have technology moving lower here. So you have uh, quite a bit of rotation here right now in the broader markets, which again is healthy. You need to see healthy market rotation for markets to move higher. Um, when we see that it's just a couple of sectors, like for example, uh, in in late uh, in early 2020, before the pandemic, we saw largely, uh, you know, technology and consumer goods moving in this leading direction, and then we saw a lot of other sectors moving in this direction. So when you have an imbalance of sectors moving higher versus lower. That's unhealthy for a market. But right now, markets are fairly balanced. You have about half of the sectors moving towards the leading category. 
and you have about half the sectors moving towards the lagging category. So on, when you look at the sector rotation model, things are still relatively healthy in this current market environment. So those are some of the things that you really need to pay attention to here in the broader markets. Now, you know, there was a question here from Karen saying markets in the USA and Sweden, can we expect a fall in the coming weeks? Inflation is is it a problem and will that become even worse? So inflation certainly is a problem. And at first, inflation is certainly something that companies are becoming more and more concerned about. So the concern is real and the concern is uh, causing many stocks, especially higher beta, higher valuation stocks to revalue in terms of a multiple contraction. So I would say that it is, it is a problem, but it's a problem only for certain industries. It's not a problem for financials because higher rates is generally good for financials, a steep rate, steepening rate curve, uh, which happens when you have inflation expectations, that's good for banks. Uh, you also tend to find sometimes uh, real estate tends to do well in that particular time. Uh, it, you know, mining-based stocks, energy-based stocks, because as commodity prices and oil prices climb, that's generally speaking good for energy, uh, you know, mining or resources type companies. So, and then it's bad for consumer services. It's bad for uh, especially consumer services that are growing very fast and trading at rich valuations, like Evo uh, Evolution Gaming. Uh, it's bad for technology technology names, it's bad for um, some utility based names because as rates rise, utility stocks that are higher dividend paying become less attractive. So it's good and bad depending on which sectors you're in. The, I think the reason that we look at these sector rotation models and it's so important to look at these sector rotation models is because it's not, it's, not, it's not a good idea just to say inflation is bad for the markets, markets are going to go down. Markets may go down but some sectors may go down more than other sectors. So it's important to understand where, if you're gonna be bearish on the markets, do you want to be bearish? And where within the markets do you want to perhaps be a little bit more bullish like banks and some of the other stocks? So as you look for opportunities here in this market, that's how you wanna think about the broader markets. So before we look at some specific ideas, again, I just want to reiterate, okay, when you're using the new options play platform, this is automatically upgraded on your platform when you log in. Uh, for any strategy that you click on modify for, uh, when you select a strike price uh, right here, when you select a strike price within your platform, when you click on it, you'll see three, um, whoops, uh, let me see if I can... No, I can't do it. But you see how there's three columns. You have the first column, which is your strike price. The second column is your premium. And the third column is your delta. This is designed so that you can quickly find the deltas that you're looking for. So if you're selling a cover call, uh, if you're going on the income tab, and you're selling a cover call, you can easily select a strike price based on delta. So if you want to sell, as you can see, the 180 is a 20 delta, the 185 is a 10 delta, and you can choose uh, your strike prices based on delta uh, very easily. And you can use this tool to help you understand how to find the right strategies. So let's take a look at some ideas. The first one I want to take a look at here is Bill. Um, Bill is an interesting uh, stock, as you can see, very strong uptrend here, um, a very strong uptrend, uh, very strong, uh, you know, I would say channel support, and we're near the bottom of the channel here and a potential bounce higher here. So the trade structure I wanted to take a look at was selling a credit spread um, using something like uh, a short put straddle, a short put vertical here, where I sold the 170, 160 put spread, collecting about three dollars, uh, three crowns for a 10 crown wide credit spread. Uh, you know, something like this, where you'll be profitable as long as Bill stays above 170 crowns. You only have losses if Bill uh, declines substantially below 160. If it's below 160, you're risking 700 crowns to make. 305 crowns. Or you can look at the 170, 165s, which simply risk less. Uh, it risks 300 crowns to make 195 crowns. So the risk to reward ratio is a little better on this particular trade, depending on how much risk you want to take and how much premium you want to collect. Uh, you know, using a put 
put vertical strategy here as suitable because even if it doesn't bounce significantly higher, even if it just moves sideways, you'll be able to be profitable on this trade as long as it stays above this 170 support level. So those are some of the ways that you can take a look at using the ideas that we're showing you here and potentially um, use options to play that. And using a put vertical spread is specifically useful, uh, especially when you see these pullbacks here, right? And this is exactly what we've seen here is a bit of a pullback. Uh, on these pullbacks, what you're really looking for is that bounce higher, right? So on each pullback, you see that bounce higher. That's exactly what we're trying to play for using a strategy like a put vertical spread. Um, another strategy I wanted to show you is using, I'm gonna use Axe Food as, a, um, as an example here. As you can see, Axe Food recently broke out to new all-time highs. And I think a lot of investors, when they see stocks like this, you know, this is a stock that has spent a lot of time trying to break above 215. As you can see, it's made multiple attempts over the past couple of years to try to break above 215. And it finally broke out above 215. And if we look at Axe Food, just to show you a longer term chart here, um, you know, this is a fairly sizable, I would say, uh, consolidation range, right? Between 190 and 210, 215 or so. It basically entered this range here in July of 2019. So it spent, you know, almost two years in this consolidation range. And this stock rallied from 131 crowns to 190 crowns to enter this consolidation range. So the if we project that out, that's a substantial move here to the upside. Now, a lot of investors sometimes feel uncomfortable, uh, I would say chasing a stock that's trading near all time highs. And that's completely understandable, which is why I think that when you play for these long-term views here for a stock like Axe Food, it's best to use options to reduce your risk as much as possible. You can, you can buy a simple call option. Now, Axe Food doesn't have a lot of strike prices, but you can buy an in-the-money strike uh, call option here. So going out to July, you can buy a 220 call option, costs you only 8.8 .8 crowns. This is a 223 uh, crown stock. So eight crowns or 8.8 .8 crowns divided by 223 crowns is only under 4% of the stock's value. So even if Axe Food, if this is you know, a potential fake breakout, and sometimes you get fake breakouts, right? Where a stock breaks out, and then immediately within a few days or a few weeks, just goes right back into the trading range. Now, the great thing about buying a call option versus buying a stock is that if the stock declines down to let's say 195 or 190, if you had bought 100 shares of the, of the stock, you would, you, would, you would look at roughly a 3,400 a crown loss. But if you bought the call option, you're, you're limiting your losses to a fraction of those losses. And then by buying an in-the-money call option, if the stock rallies you know, significantly higher here, you also see a significantly higher return versus buying the stock. So especially in these types of opportunities, where stocks are trading near all-time highs, um, and you know business and consumer confidence is doing well, manufacturing and services PMI is doing well here in in, um, in Sweden. Uh, potentially, you know some of these staple stocks are are ones that may do fairly well here, consumer uh, goods. So when you look at this, this is really where we see some potential upside opportunity, especially from a timing perspective. I do think that you just got a multi-year breakout above this 215. That is worth paying attention to, in my opinion. Just recently broke out here less than a week ago. And especially if you get a bit of a revisit back here to 220, 215, 217, those are ideal opportunities to potentially look for a potential move here to the upside. And I think to protect yourself, one of the better ways to do it is to use a call option or even a call spread for those of you that are a bit more advanced uh, that may want to use a call spread to trade this so then you can reduce your risk from 880 crowns to 810 crowns. Um, you know, it may not sound like a whole lot, 70 crowns, but that could potentially pay for your commissions on the trade, roughly, you know, most of the commissions on that trade. So 
this is really one way that you can get creative and use options and limit the amount of risk that you're taking on a specific trade. Um, so before I move on, I just want to see, does anyone have any questions or need, uh, you know, regarding, you know, these two examples or the two strategies that I just talked about on Bill selling the put credit spread on uh, Axfood buying the call uh, debit spread? Any questions? Um, if there's no questions, I'll just take a look at H&M here. Um, H&M recently had a pretty strong rally on the breakout here above 195.200, came all the way back to retest that level as support, bounced higher here, but is really losing quite a bit of momentum, also losing quite a bit of, of um, volume here on the moves higher here. So I do think that this is a potential uh, reversal here lower. Um, let me just try to show you here. Let me use an RSI. For example, uh, if we look at RSI here, as the, as the stock continues to make, let me zoom in a little bit to show you, as the stock makes higher highs in terms of price, as you can see, RSI is largely flat here. Um, this is a potential sign that, uh, that this is a stock that is at risk of pulling back here, maybe to the 190 level here. I, I'm sure many of you may have uh, been seeing in the news in terms of H&M &M and the recent spat that it's had with China. Uh, you know, H &M, China does represent a sizable market here for H&M. &M. So this is potentially at risk of a pullback here. So using a debit spread here, also a potential opportunity to take that bearish view here. And I could use instead of the 175, maybe the 185, something a little cheaper here. Um, you know, the 205, 185 put spread cost 845 crowns, 845 crowns divided by 202.30 is about 4%, right? So here you're, I'm also risking only about 4% of the stock's value to take a bearish view here on a stock like H&M. And if HMN does decline to let's say the 190 level, uh, which is the prior support here, as you can see my 845 crown risk will translate to roughly um, uh, 845 crown uh, investment would, tr would translate to roughly 655 crowns in profit, which is a 77% return on my capital if HM HM declines down to roughly 190 crowns by the July expiration. And this is a tool that anyone can use. You can type in any stock that you like. And you know, you can also you can also take the opposite view. You don't have to agree with my views. You can say, I think HM HM is going to do great. I think it's going to rebound back to its 225 level if that's the case. You can select on I'm bullish. Take a look at the bullish strategy instead on HM if instead you don't believe that it's going to continue moving while we're using the I'm bearish strategy. So this tool really allows you to customize what you want to, you know, the view that you have on a stock. And then if you need to modify it, changing the expiration dates and strike prices now allow you to select uh, expirations and strike prices based on deltas. Um, so that you can select the strike prices that you want, select the specific uh, expirations if you want to change that, and then use the PL simulator that allows you to simulate what the expected future profit or loss here on each individual trade is going to be based on your outlook of the underlying stock. And I always encourage investors, when you're looking at a trade, before you look at how much profit you can make, always look at how much you can potentially lose. What if I'm wrong on H&M? So let's just say you're bullish on H&M and you think this is gonna go back up to 225. So you look at buying a call spread. Before you look at how much money you can make on a call spread, always ask yourself, what if I'm wrong, right? What if this trade doesn't work out and the stock declines to 190 crowns? How much do I have to lose? In this particular case, you have to lose about 700 crowns. And you should always ask yourself, am I comfortable risking 700 crowns? And it's 700 crowns per contract, right? So maybe you're used to trading, I don't know, five contracts each time, but you should always be aware of what is your maximum loss here? So 3,500 crowns. Ask yourself, am I comfortable if this stock went exactly opposite the way that I expected to and I lost 3,500 crowns? Am I gonna be okay? Can I survive? 
to trade another day? If the answer is no, you should do one of two things. You should either completely walk away and not trade this at all, or you should consider changing the number of contracts to a lower number of contracts until the max loss on this trade is aligned with what you're comfortable with and what your risk tolerance is. And generally speaking, you know, for most traders, I encourage that the max loss on a trade should not exceed 2% of your total account value. So on a, on a trade that's risking roughly 1,400 crowns, what that means is that 1,400 crowns as 2% of your account um, means that you should have an account value of at least 70,000 crowns in order to trade something that has a max risk of roughly 1,400 crowns. Now, why do we use a 2% rule? It just means that if you lose the full value of this trade, you still have 98% of your total account value left to make your next trade and to continue trading. If let's say $1,400 represents 10% of your account, that means you only have a 14,000 crown account. So 1,400 would wipe out 10% of your account. You never want to risk that kind of capital because all you need is two to three trades in, that lose in a row. And now you've wiped out 60, 70% of your, uh, I'm sorry, 30 to 40% of your account. And, and that's very difficult to come back from. And most traders, at some point of your life, you will probably have three, four, maybe even five or six consecutive losing trades in a row. And you have to make sure that when that happens, even when that really bad string of trades comes along, you're not wiping out half of your account. Because if you wipe out half of your account, guess what? It's going to be very, very difficult to come back from trading that. So with that, that covers what I wanted to share with you here today with respect to how the current markets are currently uh, coming along. I do want to encourage investors, if you're still learning how to trade options, if you're, uh, you know, if you saw some of the strategies I covered here today and you're not sure how to leverage them, we have beginner, intermediate, and advanced courses that are available on demand for you to take. I just posted a link into the chat window on the screen. If you want to take these beginner, intermediate, and advanced courses, there are four parts to each course. So a total of 12 courses that we've put together to help you better understand the option strategies and concepts that I'm talking about here during today's session. So that if you take the time to go through that education and then you attend these sessions here on the market outlooks, you can really take the ideas that we generate from these uh, sessions and leverage options to trade those ideas that allow you to risk a relatively small amount of capital to take advantage of the directional views that you have. And the key here is that all of the strategies we talk about are limited risk. It defines the amount of risk that you can take so that you can control the amount of risk. So when we talk about risking no more than 2% of your account options, is a very fantastic tool to allow you to actually stick to those rules, stick to that maximum um, loss, because each strategy that we spoke about here today has a maximum loss. So that no matter what happens, you can't lose more than that amount. So as long as you stay within that 2% rule, you can actually um, manage your risk very easily using options than if you were trading the stock itself. So with that, that covers what I wanted to share with you here today. I'm sure most of you here today have already have access to Options Play, but if you do not yet have access or if you're watching this as a recording, uh, you can sign up for free access to the Options Play tool at optionsplay.se, which I also will post into the chat window here as well to help you better understand how to navigate this platform. So with that, what I'll do is I'll open this up for Q&A. Um, you can type in e either into the Q&A section or into the chat window section at the bottom of your screen. And I will try to answer as many questions as I have time for here today. Uh, you can ask me about the broader markets. You can ask me about specific option strategies. Uh, you know, Feel free to ask me anything related to trading the Nordic markets. Uh, yes, all of these courses are available online. You just go to the link on your chat window screen that I just posted to everyone, trade.optionsplay.com slash nordicedu. Uh, they are all available online.
Any questions regarding the market? Uh, the next event is in, is in exactly two weeks. Um, it is on May 26, uh, and we're we'll be covering uh, covered calls. So it's every two weeks, every other Wednesday. So basically every other Wednesday. Uh, so the next one is in two weeks on May 26. We're going to cover cover calls, and then two weeks after that, we're going to come back and review the markets again. And two weeks after that, we're going to do cash secured puts. Any idea what Yellen will say tomorrow? Um, if I knew that, I probably wouldn't be here. Uh, so no, I don't, but I expect her to be a little bit more in line than what she had said last time, which she kind of hinted at, uh, uh, that the markets needed to potentially raise rates um, a, a little faster than the market has implied. I would imagine that even if she believes that, and even if she believes that is the best thing for the market, she'll probably tone down her rhetoric because again, she's not the chairman of the Fed. She's a, a treasury secretary who does not control interest rates. Um, so uh, I would expect that you would feel, you would see a fairly controlled um a fairly controlled rhetoric from Yellen tomorrow. She may talk a little bit about the slowdown that they may that they're starting to see a little bit in the economic um, uh, numbers, specifically job reports. She may talk a little bit about inflation, but largely, I think she, uh, I would expect her to talk about the job report. But you know, this is kind of where uh, bad news is kind of good news from the perspective of if economic indicators are weak, that is a more reason to keep interest rates lower for a longer period of time. And generally speaking, equity markets respond positively to that. So this is really where bad news is good news for the equity markets. Um, do you consider correlation of Nordic markets with the US markets? What's your view on that correlation? Um, yes, I would say that there's a high correlation between uh, Nordic markets and US markets. Um, you know, We could probably do just a quick calculation here. So as you can see, the correlation between um, uh, the U.S. markets and, and, uh, and the let's see, it's slightly longer dated, um, as you can see, the correlation between uh, U.S. and uh, Nordic markets largely is very high in the 80s to even low 90 range. There are small dips, if you will, over the years away from, uh, but you know, largely they're very heavily correlated. Um, almost 90% correlated pretty much most of the time you have small dips into the 50%, but they usually don't last very long, um, but they stay very correlated for the most part. This is a daily chart here. Um, I would imagine that if you use a weekly chart, it's probably even more highly correlated. Yeah. So largely you're going to see very strong correlation between the two. And I think this is caused by more bad data than it is caused by um, actual changes in correlation. So, how do you use options play if I need to adjust my strategy before exercise? Um, so, when you, I guess, you know, when you say adjust your strategy before exercise, you know, a lot of people think about adjustments as this complex thing. Um, adjustments are really just closing your existing position and establishing a new position. And whenever you're doing that, you shouldn't think of it as, as this complex two-part trade. It's really, it's really simple. All you're doing is you're closing an existing position and you're trying to decide what should my new position be. Now, my philosophy of establishing a new position is that what you had before should not influence how you establish a new position. Meaning, if let's say you currently have an H&M uh, vertical spread that you're trying to roll because you're trying to adjust, you really should be looking at the adjustment as a brand new trade. Your old trade should not influence what adjustments you make, meaning you should still follow the best practices for 
you know, uh, uh, let's say you let's say you have a debit spread that you're trying to roll to a, a new expiration or a new strike price. It doesn't matter what your old strike price is, what your old expiration is. You should still follow simple best practices for establishing your new position. So, for example, uh, we always talk about if you're talking about a new position, uh, you know, on a debit spread, you should go out roughly 60 days. So that's why we default to the July expiration. You should look at buying, uh, you know, the first in the money option which is why our platform, when you look at it, it'll default to the 220, 225, because the 200, I'm sorry, the 200, 225, because the 200s are the first in the money options. The 225s are roughly 20 delta, which is where you want to roughly sell on a debit spread. So regardless of what position you had in H&M, if you're trying to adjust a debit spread to a new debit spread, you should always adjust it to this new strategy and then close out your old position. And if you can do those two trades in one trade, sure, that's what we call an adjustment trade. But an adjustment trade is really just a fancy term for closing out an existing position and establishing a new one in a single trade. But whether you trade it as a single trade or not, and you, or if you trade it as two separate trades, the rules are the same. And that is really following the fact that regardless of what you currently have, the new position should always follow best practices. You should not let an old position influence how you adjust that position because then you're trading something that's less optimal. If let's say you're, you're changing your strike prices because you're thinking to yourself, oh, I wanna trade this at a net credit or if I wanna trade this at a net debit, then you're likely establishing a new position that's suboptimal. You don't wanna do that. So that's why I always encourage investors when you're making an adjustment, don't let the old position influence what you do for the new position. Your new position should always follow the same best practices every single time, uh, uh, you know, regardless of what your old position is. I hope that makes sense. Can you elaborate about the scores and the circles and how they're calculated? Uh, absolutely. So the scores are calculated from basically these three indicators, max risk, max reward, and probability of profit. And the reason that we created this is because most investors, when you look at these three strategies, um, they're really, there's really no way to compare them, right? Because buying a stock and buying a call has unlimited max reward, which means that you can't really calculate a risk reward on something that has unlimited max reward. And this has a 32% profit. This has 35%. This has 46%. Which one's better, right? You know, is it better to have $20,000 worth of risk with unlimited reward, but a 46% probability of profit? Or should I go for unlimited reward with only $1,200 profit, but a very low probability of profit? Or should I go for something in between $1,500 worth of reward, 900 crowns of uh, risk, but 35% probability of profit? The answer is it's very difficult to tell. That's why we created the options play score. We wanted to give you a, a way to look at all of those metrics side by side in a single score that allows you to quickly identify which one has the best risk reward ratio. Now, in this particular case, these two, as you can see, are very similar. One is 90, one is 89. And the fact that they're yellow means that they're average, meaning they're not very good, they're not very bad, they're average risk reward ratios. The one in the middle, as you can see, is a 71 and it's red, what this tells me is that this is a relatively poor risk to reward. And then if you trade something, I don't know if I'm able to find something like this. Ah, here we go. If I'm able to trade this particular vertical spread, but I have a $1,600 reward, uh, 900 crown risk, and a 36% probability of profit, that's going to that's going to give me the best risk to reward. It's going to be slightly better than this, and because it's green, that means the risk to reward is better than the other two. So that's how you read them. You don't have to think about it too much. Just think of their their relative. Um, risk to reward uh, metrics. Now, keep in mind that don't confuse a high score as something that means that you're going to be profitable, right? High scores does not mean you're going to be profitable. It just means that the risk reward is skewed in your favor by a small amount. And when I say a small amount, what I mean by that is that markets are largely efficient. 
it's not like there's just free money to be made in the markets. If there was, everyone would be trading them until that's uh, it's gone away. So the edge that you get with a high options point score is relatively small. It's probably somewhere in the 20, 30, 40 crowns per contract edge. But basically what we're saying is that you're able to buy this option relatively cheaply versus if it was a high options point score, it's relatively expensive to purchase. Any other questions? Uh, do you have any plans to introduce an I'm neutral button in the tool? Yes, we're actually in the works of doing that. And the I'm neutral button will actually show you credit spreads. So it will default to the credit spreads that I was showing you here before. Um, so yes, that is something that we are currently working on. Any other questions? If there are no other questions, I just want to thank everyone for taking the time out here this evening. I hope that this was helpful in giving you a better understanding as to how I'm viewing the broader markets, some option strategies, and some ideas that you can trade. And I look forward to having you guys here in a couple of weeks where we discuss option selling strategies, specifically cover calls, and showing you the different tools that we have built to help make that strategy as easy as possible and to show you how you can generate a fair amount of income across your entire equity portfolio using that one strategy. So thank you so much. Have a great evening, and I'll see you guys here in two weeks' time.